Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Can I interest you in some poop today? No? Well, how about the inner tube of life itself? I've been promising to do an episode on the amazingly magical powers of your fabulous poop, but each time I prepare, I think, huh, there is a question I don't really know the answer to. The whole field of microbiome is moving so fast. I wonder if any world expert does. What should we make into the fascinating research into fecal transplants for the bacterial infection C. diff, which can be deadly, ulcerative colitis, even autism? I was particularly impressed with a paper in The Lancet, which is about using fecal transplants to treat ulcerative colitis, done by a group of Australians who are generally considered to be some of the world's experts on fecal transplants and the microbiome. So I contacted one of the study's authors, Dr. Johan, who I knew could explain things really clearly. He graciously let me bombard him with questions, including ones he probably never expected, like how does our microbiome influence our resistance to COVID-19? I know, he was so fascinating, I couldn't stop asking questions. So I broke this interview down into chapters. It's a YouTube feature where you can skip ahead to the sections that really interest you. I hope you enjoy this as much as I did, and Dr. Johan, thanks so much. You're amazing. My name's Johan. Hello. It's a good thing uh, I can call you Dr. Johan because I, yeah. I, don't speak, I don't speak Afrikaans to pronounce your last name. <laughs> Just Johan is mine, mate. <laughs> so uh, can you give us a little bit of background? Uh, I think the audience here will be more towards your patients than other doctors and researchers and things like that. So people would love to know. Um, you grew up in South Africa. You went to Cambridge. You have a PhD after your name. And yeah. now you're with a group of um, quite an elite group of microbiology researchers in Australia. Well, so basically my my first interest in, in academic life was in immunology and then I became a gastroenterologist. I went sort of over the world, South Africa, England, and I've ended up in Australia, basically because South Africa is a, is a slightly dangerous place at the moment. Yeah, that's hard, yeah. And Australia <clears throat> is a fantastic place. Yeah. And you live on the Gold, Gold Coast, right? Uh, Sunshine Coast. Sunshine the Coast, yeah. The yeah. Gold Coast has its, has its joys, but there's no comparison. The Sunshine Coast oh, yeah. is much nicer, and even the Gold Coast people would agree with that, I yeah, think. I've been there a few times, loved it. Your views on the microbiome. I heard you on another podcast say when Thomas Barodi first started saying he thinks it may be as significant as the invention of antibiotics, you said, wow, that's, that's pushing it. But you've evolved now, and you're... Are you there? Yes. So I'll tell you. So so my initial meeting with Thomas Barodi, who, who is absolutely a pioneering genius and an extremely nice man as well. And then, have you met Thomas or not? I haven't. He's, a, he's genuinely the most out of the box thinker you'll ever meet. A fantastic guy. And the first time I came across his name was when I read an article about treating ulcerative colitis patients with fecal transplants. And I presented this article as a registrar to my, my colleagues. And everyone was sort of, you know, looking at this very skeptically. And I thought to myself, there's merit to this. And then fast forward many years where I was at a conference in Australia with my my mentor, Professor Michael Cam, who's, who's a wonderful guy. And I did my postdoctoral sort of time with him in England. He was a, a major player and still is a major player in academic gastroenterology in the world, Australia, England, particularly in China as well. He does fantastic work there. And we sort of got together, all three of us having a beer after some meetings. Both, both those colleagues were much more important than I am. They were chairing the meetings. I was just an audience member. And uh, we sort of got together and said, let's do the work. Let's do the study. And we did a very comprehensive, proper double-blind controlled study looking at ulcerative colitis and fecal transplant. And it was published in The Lancet in 2017 and really showed that fecal transplant is as good as giving steroids. And it's as good as any of these other modern anti 
you know, these anti-TNF antibodies at inducing remission and controlling ulcerative colitis, which was... Well, that was a really, <clears throat> yeah, that was a really extraordinary study. I read that. Um, I spent yeah. hours reading that. It's, um, there's so many nuances and details in that study that are fascinating. Um, so uh, I have a, a number of questions about that study. Um, right. but, yes. but before I go there, um, you've commented on C. diff before on how fecal transplants are just the standard care of treatment now. And they're so effective. They're like 90 yes. plus percent effective. Yeah, 91% yeah. effective. Yeah. Um, where you are in Australia, are fecal transplants, are, is that the norm for C. diff or do they have to go through a heavy course of antibiotics first? So, so I think to to be perfectly accurate. So it is, in my opinion, and, and Professor Barodi's opinion, it is the absolute standard of care for resistant C. diff. So oh, these are patients with C. diff who have failed antibiotic treatment and mostly more than one course of antibiotic treatment. So these are patients who've been on metronidazole, which is still probably your first line, and then oral vancomycin, which is very effective for C. diff treatment, mm -hmm. but quite a substantial minority of patients fail that. And those patients, I've just had a patient that I, that I did a fecal transplant with on three days ago, elderly lady, antibiotics in hospital, and she's had 10 courses of vancomycin oh. and still has terrible C. diff. And there's many, thousands of patients in America and in Australia who suffer from recurrent Clostridium difficile. And the only way of treating them really is with, with fecal transplant. So what you do is you do a colonoscopy and you inject the fecal material. Obviously it's been filtered and looked after and the donors have been very thoroughly screened. And then you inject it into the colon or the terminal island through a colonoscope and Really, if you use a certain sort of way of doing it, you can get 90 to almost 100% cure of, of this very nasty organism. So for resistant and recurrent C. diff, that's the standard of care. I see. <clears throat> and the particular way that you do it is you get several different donor stools and mix them together to increase the odds? Yes. So that's a... That's a all these questions you ask are very, very good questions, but, but to fully answer them, it's, it's actually quite complicated. So I'm going to take you a little bit back to the osteocolitis paper, the, one of the original papers done by a fantastic scientist called Paul Moyedi in Canada. And they did quite a smallish study with osteocolitis and they used fecal stool transplant. And they, when they looked at the analysis, they, they didn't get successful treatment. But when they stratified that study, they saw that one donor in particular was successful at, at doing this. And using the one donor, they called it a super donor, it actually helped with the osteocolitis. And on the basis of this, we decided to use pool donor in, in our study. And that was driven largely by, by Professor Barodi. It's, it's, uh, it just makes your chances of getting the successful or the super donor that much higher. And we see the same thing in Clostridium patients. I've had some patients, so mostly with Clostridium patients, we, we use family stool pa people as donors. So a family member or a friend or the spouse of the patient will donate stool we'll check the stool and then use a sort of a fresh stool sample to do this. But my problem with that is several patients actually didn't clear their C. diff. So there's stool is obviously of different quality. So some people have really good stool and some people have not such good stool. So the way I do it now is I use a, not just a single donor. We've, we've got special donors. We check them out. And when I do a colonoscopy with fecal transplant, I don't pool the stool because that makes it a little more difficult. If there's any complication, you don't know where the problem's coming from. So I use separate donors. 
So each syringe that I inject into the patient's colon, it's about a 50 ml syringe, which I then inject into either the terminal ileum or the cecum. Each syringe is a single one donor, but then I inject more than two syringes into the donor. And that's given us at this stage, 100% cure rate. But wow. obviously the more we do, you know, we will find failures because everything does fail at some point. But so I think the combination of, of using more than one donor for ulcerative colitis and for clostridium and probably for other things as well is, is probably the way to go. And the reason for this really is that we don't know what is helping. So we know that stool and the microbiome contains zillions of organisms. We know that it's unbelievably complex. We haven't worked out, and nobody has, exactly which organism is successful. We probably don't even know if it's, if it's bacteria. It could be something else. It could be archaea, which is a special sort of bacteria. It could be fungal elements. It could even be viral elements that are important. One just doesn't know. So, so the microbiome is massively complex. It consists out of many different sort of types of organisms, not only bacteria, but other sort of branches of organisms. And I think if you give multiple healthy donor infusions to the patients, you, you just make your chances that much more. Interestingly, there are other ways of giving stool transplants. So it's accepted to use a tube that you put through the nose. In fact, the first, the first proper C. diff paper was a Dutch paper by Van der Noot, where they actually put a tube into the nose and into the small bowel and infused it that way. I find that a little bit not so cool. So I don't use that method. I prefer, you know, the money shot for me is to go into the colon. You get a high concentration. The transplant doesn't have to go all through the small bowel and get denatured and, and you know, not, not successfully taken the colon because that's where the activity is with C. diff. But there are also acceptable ways of giving a fecal transplant with capsules. So you take the fecal material, you filter it, sieve it, put it into a capsule, freeze it down at a minus 80 temperature, and then you give the patients these capsules. They, in the sort of popular literature, they call them crapsules. I don't really like that name, but, but that sort of is the essence of this. So you, there's three basic ways of giving a fecal transplant. The high concentration and the money shot for me is, is to do the colonoscopy and infuse into the colon. With those patients, you can also use enemas. So the other way, of, so basically with the ulcerative colitis study, we use the initial infusion into the colon, and then we use enemas, which the patients take home and give five or three times a week as an ongoing treatment for four or five weeks, as, as that study explained. But you can also use capsules, and you can also use nasogeginal infusion techniques, which I don't use. I think it's a little bit complicated. So in your study in the Lancet, you had a, um, it appeared from the data that you had a donor that was associated with more remissions than other donors were? No, that was in the Canadian study. Not oh, in the, the Canadian lot. study. So we anticipated that problem. And on the basis of that study and just Thomas Brody's thinking, I mean, he's been doing this for decades. Yeah. So without a doubt, he's the man who had the most feel and touch for this. He, he and myself as well, we were very keen to use, to pool the donors and then get a multi-donor type structure so that if there was a super donor, we'd probably capture it with the multi-donor stool. I see. <clears throat> and in terms of the donors uh, for this, this study you did in The Lancet, there was uh, only 12% of potential donors actually made it. Yeah. And so the other 88% got screened out. That's even gone down. So, so the sort of prime author on that study, a uh, uh, very, very brilliant young chap, well, he's not that young anymore, he's sort of gone on since we've done the study. So uh, Dr. Sudarshan Paramsati, he, he was the guy who did the hard work. And um, he then subsequently published a paper looking at donor and how many donors can be accepted. And really with the new studies we're doing, that's gone down to about 5%. In our, in our donor screening program, we know more than 5%. And the reason for that is to, to screen the donors, the screenings become much more intense. 
So you do PCR screening, which is super sensitive. You check for parasites, you check for bacteria. There's, there's two common commensal parasites, blastocystis and dientamoeba, which I think don't, don't really cause any problems. But they, if they are picked up by this very sensitive genetic analysis in the donor stool, we don't use them. Also helicobacter, so we check for helicobacter in the stool, the helicobacter antigen, much less common now in the Western population, but very common in African populations. Uh, and we also check for viruses, we check for Clostridium difficile, that changed Clostridium's name to Clostridoites, but you know, people understand Clostridium well. And you know, we check for more and more as as our systems develop and as we come we become more aware of problems. We've extended the donor screening. We, our lab checks for E. coli. Uh, it's not on the guidelines, but we check for the different sort of strains of E. coli. And we check for antibiotic resistant organisms, which is very important because there was a patient, an immunosuppressed patient who received donor stool. That was by the nasogeginal route. And a bacterially resistant organism actually got into that patient's blood and led to a fatality. So, so this procedure is not without complications, and and, and that and that person had a form of E. coli that he passed on. Is that right to the immunocompromised yes, that, patient? So that was that was the FDA published that case. So it was a an organism that was multi-resistant. I think it it was a I don't know if it was vancomycin resistant. I'm not I can't remember, but a multi-resistant bacterium that was passed on into an immunosuppressed patient, which then caused a septicemia and actually caused the death of that patient. Very, very rare. There's been, you know, one in a million type complication of that nature, but certainly it isn't a trivial procedure. You've got to be very careful. The patients need to know that there are complications, but it all comes down to really testing your donors so that there's nothing nasty that you know of in the donor stool. Having said that, obviously some things can slip through it can be organisms that we don't test for because really there's a universe of organisms out there that can cause problems. So, so we're very much aware of that and almost 95% of our donors fall out. Interestingly, a lot of our, our donors are obviously young fit people and quite a lot of young fit people have got slightly odd diets. So a lot of them eat raw foods, raw eggs, raw meat, and we've added to our questionnaire that sort of dietary information. So if you're someone who loves eating raw chicken or likes eating raw eggs, like some of the some of our donors are elite athletes that do that sort of thing, and then they can get exposed to that. Your incidence of salmonella, obviously, if you eat raw eggs, and, and those sort of organisms are, are obviously increased. Mm -hmm. So we, we're very, very aware of that and very cautious. Is there an age limit for donors? There shouldn't be, but we probably, you know, between 20 and 60 is probably the age limit. But really it's about how clinically well your donors are. One of the things that we, that we did in our last study, and we had an enormously complex discussion about what donors should be in and what donors should be out. But um, one of the, the criteria was obesity. So as you know, obesity seems to be related to your microbiome. So, so there have been very good mouse studies showing that if you take a, a fat human's stool and you put it into a mouse, then that mouse becomes fat. You take a thin human stool and you put it into a mouse and that mouse becomes thin. We haven't been able to do that in humans, but it's, it would sound conceptually wonderful. You've, you're overweight and we get a fecal transplant and it, it helps with your diet. Certainly it would help with certain things and certainly um, metabolic syndrome which is the type 2 diabetes thing seems to be associated with the microbiome as well but it's it's we haven't extrapolated that data onto onto humans so what we can achieve in mice is fantastic we can't always achieve the same in humans obviously so, I see. so do you uh in your screening for donors uh do you look at microbiome diversity like presence of Bravitella or something like that? Certain no, we don't. We don't. Um, and the reason for that is simply expense. It's, it's very expensive. 
assessing the microbiome and looking carefully at the microbiome with the, the different genetic ways of doing it is, is sometimes helpful and sometimes not helpful. I think if you've got a healthy, fit donor who is otherwise well, you know, you sort of make the assumption that the microbiome is, is diverse. To actually quantify diversity, diversity of microbiome is quite difficult and very expensive. I see. Yeah. And do you have a sense <clears throat> for what creates a diverse microbiome, like not taking antibiotics? Is that on your questionnaire? Well, absolutely. So, so that's the that's the essence of the whole microbiome science and study. Mm -hmm. So we can't we can't I can't for instance easily take a patient and give them a diverse microbiome. But I can certainly look at a patient and talk to a patient and think to myself, this person's microbiome is absolutely rubbish. And I can show you patients and people who've got fantastic microbiomes. And one of the lectures I've given, one of the, the slides in the lecture I give, I was born in South Africa, as, as you know, and there's a very famous Time magazine front page article, which was published, I think, three or four years ago. When I, it's an iconic image. When you see it, you'll recognize it immediately. And it shows a suburb in South Africa. So the wealthy sort of suburb with large mansion like houses and swimming pools and, you know, very wealthy people living literally 50 meters away from the Alexandra Township, which is one of the most deprived townships in South Africa. So very high density housing you know, very tough living conditions and a river flowing through the township called the Yuxka River, which I think has the highest E. coli quantification in the whole world. It's, it's basically a sewage plant going straight through the township. So, so these, the, the people living on the left in the smart, wonderful houses have got a rubbish microbiome and the people on the right living in the sort of really tough township conditions with this very polluted river going through their, their township, they've got fantastic microbiomes. And the essence of having a good microbiome, and we get our micro, microbiome, whether you like it or not, from fecal oral transmission. So what we've achieved in the West and our sophisticated society is a complete abolition, really, of fecal, of fecal oral transmission. And if you think about where your microbiome originally comes from, your, when you're born as a baby, your microbiome is non-existent. You don't have a microbiome. But as babies get born, their faces transverse the mother's perineum and the mother's anus. And that's where we get our first really proper dose of our microbiome from our mother. And I don't know if you saw that, this recent study, which was all over the sort of normal press and, and normal data as well, where they've taken cesarean section babies and taken stool from the mother and sort of filtered it and now they feed that stool to the cesarean section babies and find that they've got a better microbiome. So our first exposure to the microbiome is through natural birth and, and clearly that, that changes. So if you, let's say, born in an African village or a place which has got, you know, you're not born in a shiny sterile hospital, your birth will be accompanied by a very rich microbiome exposure. Where, as if you're born in the sterile Western hospital, where everyone's wearing gloves and masks, and you have a cesarean section, perhaps your initial microbiome exposure will be pretty, you know, not so good. And then, if you if you then go from your mother's, if you go from your mother's to your mother's house, and that's in the shiny hospital, and you go to the shiny you know, hygienic household where, you know, everything is wonderful and there's disinfectants all over the place and everyone washes their hands all the time. And you rather go to a place in 
in South Africa or in Africa or in Tanzania, where people have a much more natural approach to life, they they're not brought up in the most hygienic way, obviously, and they they you know big extended society people hug, they touch, they they eat, they, they've got extended families. Those those people will have fantastic microbiomes, and it's a self fulfilling prophecy. Their microbiomes improve and enrich all the time. In the Western Chinese place, we get antibiotics, we get treatment, we see pediatricians. In the less sophisticated places, obviously, there's much less exposure and much less unnecessary gratuitous antibiotic you know, um, prescription. So, so the, the less sophisticated Western medical hygienic you are, the better your microbiome is going to be. The less rubbish food we eat, the better your microbiome is going to be. And so I ran the Comrades Marathon in South Africa. <laughs> yes. and the South Africans are crazy. It's 56 miles, not 26 like the American marathons. Yes. And, nutrition, yeah, and, uh, and nutrition is a really big issue. So all the poor kids from the townships were bringing these boxes of whatever, root vegetables and, you know, and mm -hmm. all the other runners were just reaching in and, and eating them. <laughs> And I resisted for the first 10 miles because I'm American and I'm thinking hygiene hypothesis and so on. But the last 46 miles, I think I enriched my bi microbiome. By That's just taking right? Whatever, sweet potatoes and whatever. And there must've been, I think, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of spectators lining the, the course. Yeah. And most of them are little children with their hands out and you got to low five them as you go by. Yeah, so, so you, you did fantastic work with your microbiome. That's why you look so yeah. wonderful and healthy. <laughs> There was, a, there was a very, very good paper uh, written by a chap called Stephen O'Keefe, who had a very close connection with, with South Africa and Africa. And he, he looked at African Africans and African Americans. And he looked at the microbiome, the diversity, the diet, and things like that. And, you know, genetically things are similar. Well, that's the supposition. Although it's not absolutely true because. In fact, it's not true at all because African genetic diversity is enormous. Mm. So, just to digress slightly, you know, people, you know, Africa is the cradle of humanity. And if you, an African who lives a hundred kilometers away from another African, is genetically more diverse than than a North American man or woman and a Chinese man or woman. So African genetic diversity is probably a hundred orders of magnitude more than than anyone else. Yeah. So 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 but nevertheless the the, the assumption is that the genetics of of African Africans and the genetics of African Americans will be the same. The disease profile of the African American and the African African in the rural setting, we didn't look at, at urban African Africans, which is, is a completely different issue in itself. And I can maybe discuss that a little bit later with you. And they found that the microbiome differed substantially. The disease profile differed entirely. Diseases like colon cancer, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, fatty liver disease were very much a feature in in the African Americans, very much not a big deal in the African Africans. And so what they did is they changed the diets. They, they gave the African Africans an American type diet and they gave the Americans an African type diet. And the extraordinary thing that was that within two or three weeks, the microbiome of the African um, Americans changed dramatically, became much more diverse and changed for the better. So, so you can actually change your microbiome with a proper and a good African type diet very quickly. And, and, and an African diet means what? Whole foods, plant fibers? Okay, so no, once again, no Twinkies. The African, the African diet has changed. So when I started as a, as a young doctor, I worked in places where, you know, South Africa as a population has changed dramatically. So in, 
in my first sort of years as a young doctor, we never ever saw Africans with type 2 diabetes. We never saw Africans with heart disease. We never ever saw Africans with the sort of Western type diseases, you know, cardiac disease, heart attacks, you know, that sort of, you know, the sort of classic, you know, fat guy's disease. We didn't see that. But within 10 or 15 years, the cardiac ICU filled up with, with Africans, first African men and then African women who started developing the Western type diseases. And that's got to do with the dietary change, you know, McDonald's, Coke, processed foods. But the, the rural Africans who don't eat those sort of foods, they eat plant-based foods, they eat unprocessed foods, they eat lots of raw foods, lots of really, really high fiber foods. That's how you get a good microbiome. In conjunction, obviously, with, with you know, more contact, living closer to people, high density. And that, that, that gives you a rich microbiome, which I think is unbelievably important. And as far as, as the value of having this sort of African microbiome, is, is, you know, incalculable. So if you look at, at someone like Dennis Burkitt, who discovered Burkitt's lymphoma and, and decades ago, 40 years ago, went to Africa and looked at the, looked at demographics of, of Africans and the diseases of Africans and went to Uganda and said that you will not find diverticular disease in, in rural Africans. You don't find colon cancer more or less. You do find it, but it's tenfold less than, than in, you know, in, in non-rural African populations. Um, no diabetes, no heart disease. And that's all got to do with diet, microbiome, and obviously other factors as well. You know, like not, not driving to work in your car and not sitting at a desk and looking at the computer day and night. So, so there's lots of issues, but I'm sure the microbiome plays a, a definitely important role. And if you look at, at recently the, the incidence and the mortality of COVID in Africa, it's, it's negligible when you compare it to, compare it to places like Italy and, and, and North America. And almost certainly one of the, one of the important factors there is the microbiome. I, I did predict from the very beginning, I predicted that the African mortality rate would be extremely low. And if we look at Nigeria, for instance, Nigeria was one of the first African countries. The Nigerian country has got a massive diaspora. And there's people, Nigerians and, and overseas people moving in and out of Nigeria all the time. They're an extremely cosmopolitan society. And right back in February, an Italian man brought COVID into Nigeria. And there's been almost no a negligible incidence of death in Nigeria from COVID. And it's a densely populated country. Lagos is a densely populated city. There's no way of stopping COVID spreading through Nigeria, but the Nigerians are not resistant to COVID, but they certainly have got such a fantastic microbiome that, that it, I think, affects the way your whole body functions and the way you, you can attack diseases and the way your immune system works. You know. what, about, what about the C. diff? <clears throat> Where, and so I, re I heard your comment about uh, the rates of C. diff in America. So I went and got a press release from 2015 from the CDC. Mm. And I had to read it about four different times to, to believe my eyes yeah. and what I was seeing. But they were yeah. reporting almost 500,000 cases in 2015 of C. diff a year in the mm. United States. And they said, and I read this three different times to make sure that I was understanding what they were saying, and it wasn't a misprint, that 29,000 of those patients die within 30 days of diagnosis, mm -hmm. and 15,000 of them, uh, the death can be attributed to C. diff alone. So I mean, basically, that's sort of, so that the death rate from C. diff in the USA is, it's difficult to determine because many of the patients are old, they're hospitalized, and, you know, but, but certainly, one would imagine that it, it's definitely between 20 and 30,000 a year. Wow. So an absolutely substantial mortality rate due to C. diff. It's not a trivial disease. You know, obviously, you know, the, the, the United States is an enormous country. And 
you know, even a small percentage of a very big number does, does, gives you a big number. So if you look at the mortality rate of 30,000 a year, that certainly is a lot of people, but it's, you know, percentage wise isn't high. But, but you, you read about the opioid mortality rates in America, and that's between 43 and 50,000 a year. Yeah, you certainly read quite a lot about that. So this is more or less the same, same mortality rate. And it's not something that you read about a lot, and it's, it's actually treatable. So in America, <clears throat> the FDA regulates uh, fecal matter as, as a drug. And it's only indicated, it's only approved for C. diff, not for ulcerative colitis or anything like that. And I, I was just, I don't know exactly where Australia sounds, although I noticed your lead author, whose Indian name I can't pronounce, mm. uh, just recently wrote a paper about um, sort of best practices for yes. fecal transplants in Australia. And, yeah. um, but there didn't seem to be much talk about regulating it. In the European Union, they seem to think it's going to drive a lot of people underground if you try to regulate it, you know, as a drug. And, and that seems to be happening in the U.S. There's a lot of people who are doing, you know, they're getting their husband to donate, yes. it, using their blender to mix it up with saline solution and using a home enema kit and not going to see a gastroenterologist like you. And that seems yes. a little so, bit scary to me. So the, so there are, so that was a, that was a, a, a consensus statement brought up by, by Sudarsh and Karen Sothi and you'll notice Tom Barodi is on that panel. It's quite a big panel of about 20 people. Rupert was on the panel as well. So all these, all these individuals were co-authors and members of the same study. What, um, what was deeply hurtful was that I wasn't invited to that, that, that meeting, which is a pity because I'm not going to Melbourne. Uh, but nevertheless, so they, they had a, a very, very um, well thought out and excellently constructed consensus statement there. Now, remember, a consensus statement is, is always, you know, just a statement. And their recommendations were made to the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, sort of the Australian FDA, if you would. And they have come up with, with strong and excellent recommendations about donor school. And they've published quite a lot about this. But it's not something that's being enforced at the moment. So if I, for instance, want to do the fecal transplant and I feel qualified to do it and I follow the rules, which obviously we do, I can do it. I don't know of any, I think people in Australia are very rules based and it's a, it's a very structured society and it's also a very small country. So I don't know if you ever saw that movie, with Dustin Hoffman, a fantastic movie called Little Big Man. Oh, I did, but, yeah. I loved it. It's a fantastic yeah. movie, but really an amazing movie about the indigenous uh, American population and, and this, this person's interaction with it. But I always refer to Australia as a little big country because it's got 25 million people and it's more or less the size of continental USA. So it's an enormous country with a very, very low population density if you look at the whole country. Um, so it's easy to regulate this country. People are very rules based and I don't know of anyone that's, you know, stepping outside, outside those parameters. I would imagine in America, you, there is that company called the Open Biome, which, which does, does do this. And I'm, I, I'm, I was, I thought that you could get fecal transplants through them in, in America. You could, you could, you could, you could get the crapsules. <laughs> Sorry about yeah. the name. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you could get that. Um, but I noticed on their website, they've said they've concentrated on uh, COVID for some reason. I think, I so. think COVID. COVID is, well, we haven't even spoken about that, but COVID is a massive, massive deal. So I would imagine that in America, COVID has totally, you know, really stopped fecal transplant in strikes because you've got a population with a high incidence of COVID. We are blessed in Australia in that in Queensland, we basically COVID-free. 
So we haven't had a case of COVID in Queensland for a long, long time, more than 30 days. We're very similar to New Zealand, which has eradicated COVID. Um, there are, so Tasmania has eradicated COVID. Victoria, which is the other state, has got virtually eradicated COVID after an incredibly tough lockdown. So the Australian approach to COVID, even though they don't, they don't, they call it a suppression strategy. In essence, they've got an eradication strategy. So really, there's no real risk of getting COVID from anyone in Australia at the moment if you're in certain states. Certainly in Queensland, we're very, very safe. Uh, and so my donors, we do test them for COVID, but there's a negligible chance of getting COVID. We can't really test stool. And we know that COVID is in stool and you can almost certainly transfer COVID if you do pass it on with stool. And I would imagine that the stool banks in the US really would be too frightened to, to really get stool donation because of COVID. Because there's no real way of, of testing stool, no structured and, and data centered way of testing stool for COVID. So I think it would be extraordinarily dangerous in, in a in a high incidence COVID community to to donate stool. So do we know why stool works for C diff? And we'll get to ulcerative colitis, but it's so extraordinary mm -hmm. that one um, infusion often works in what twelve to twenty four to forty eight hours or so, and. And it's got that level of effectiveness, but we don't really know what it is in the stool. I mean, even if the stool is a little bit sterile, I mean, isn't it, doesn't it go partly sterile just by coming out because the anaerobes die and exposure to UV light and so on? Absolutely. So, so this is the, I don't know how much time we have, but I mean, you know, basically, this it's is your schedule. This is weeks of, of discussion, if, you know, I mean, it's so complex and interesting. So, so, what you say is quite correct, and that's why we've only been able to appreciate what's happening in stool and what the microbiome is and how it works only since we've, we've started the genetic analysis. So, so bacteriology and microbiology is, is traditionally, according to the postulates by Robert Koch, uh, of the Robert the Robert Koch Institute in Germany, which is our leading institute, and you read about it in COVID all the time. But Koch's postulates are essentially, you think it's a, it's a bug causing a problem, you need to isolate and culture the bug, then you describe the bug, and then you inoculate the bug into an animal and find the same disease happening in that animal, or, you know, human, not obviously good in humans. Uh, although some, some clinicians have have heroically done that, you know, particularly John Snow, that surgeon who didn't self inoculate himself with, with organisms in the in the distant past. But but so the the sort of the sort of preconceived idea and the sort of bacteriological paradigm is that you culture things and then you know what's going on. If you culture stool, even though these organisms are incredibly robust and massively variable. If you culture stool, they will die because they're anaerobic. So if you culture stool, you'll culture an absolute minority of completely unimportant organisms. And that's where probiotics come from. So probiotics come from culturing stool. And in fact, one of the famous probiotics we use was cultured in the 1916s from a certain the missile strain of organisms. So, it's a, so you culture stool. And the only organisms you grow are obviously the promiscuous aerobic organisms that can be cultured. So you cut up from your stool culture or your probiotics 99.9% .9 of the organisms. And coincidentally, you cut out all the important organisms because the important organisms are organisms that, that don't like oxygen. So the important anaerobic organisms don't grow outside the body. And that's why we have to, when we do our stool transplants, we've got to get fresh stool and put it in the minus 80 freezer as soon as possible. Because as soon as these organisms see the, the light of day, they start dying. Uh, so, so that's, and we only know really by, by doing these special genetic cultures what's actually going on in stool. 
And then looking at that, we found this unbelievable, you know, incredible diversity, which is which is which is mind boggling that for every one cell in your body, there's approximately well, it depends. Some people have said up to 10, but probably 1.3 body stool micro, microbial cells in your body. And that's only the bacteria. That's not the phages and the viruses and, and the other funny organisms. So 10 to 1. So you are, as you are sitting there, a microbiome. Your microbiome exceeds your own body cells and exceeds your own body DNA by orders of magnitude. So in fact, humans are just a sort of vehicle for their own microbiome, more or less. So, so that's, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. So this, this massively variable second sort of organism growing inside you, which, which produces hormones, produces and regulates serotonin, produces chemicals, is involved in psychiatric and mental health issues. Is involved in Parkinson's, is involved in autism, is, is involved in virtually every process of your body. You can't be a healthy human being unless you have these organisms in your gut. So germ-free organisms don't survive and they don't live and they can't prosper. So without your microbiome, you are a nothing. And and what exactly is important to the microbiome is we don't know. Is it is it stuff they produce? We're not sure. Is it neurotransmitters? They certainly do that. We, we're not sure. What makes the easiest conceptual way of looking at your microbiome is to actually look at Clostridium. So Clostridium is caused by the overgrowth of a nasty organism, which overgrows and, you know, like with anything, you give people antibiotics, it kills the good stuff, and then one of the bad boys overgrows. So you put back the good stuff, it sort of pushes out the bad stuff and patients get well. And we know that happens in 91% or more patients. The, the amazing thing though, and you alluded to this earlier, the extraordinary thing is that with our C. diff patients, you inject the stool into their colons and almost instantly they feel better. It's, it's amazing. So at the latest, by the very next day, they feel much better. So this happens quickly. And so, I mean, it, it can't simply be that, they, that they're killing the Clostridium. They're just obviously taking over where the Clostridium were. So they push the Clostridium out of the bowel niche and then eventually completely eradicate the Clostridium. And the eradication is measured by the Poly polymerase chain reaction, which is a massively sensitive thing. It'll pick up one in a zillion organisms. And to me, that's that's extraordinary. I mean, you would imagine that that the Clostridium organism would would sort of cling on somewhere, you know, just by its fingernails to a little cliff edge where the where the good guys can't get at it. But no, that's not how it works. It actually the good guys actually dynamically eradicate the Clostridium. It's it's amazing. And I think they do the same sort of thing. In, in bowels with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's bowels or irritable bowel type patients. So, and, but, but what organisms are important, we don't know. There is some, some evidence and there's some sort of good evidence that Bicalobacterium prasnutsi is an organism which plays an important role. So we know that this organism actually is immunomodulated, so it dampens down your immune system. It seems to do it by the IL-10 mechanism. There's some very, very good data on that. And there are labs that can now isolate and grow it. And you can actually give a, there's been some studies on giving Ficalobacterium plasnitsi in a capsule form to patients. And that's obviously the way to go. I, I think it's much more complex than that. I think it's not one organism doing good things. It's many organisms interacting and doing lots of good things. So that's how I think it works. It was an so, amazing, <clears throat> sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, you remind me of a, a couple of graphs I see quite often. The microbiologists include in their presentations like Rob Knight. It's uh, from Professor Bach, the microbiologist in France, who shows a chart from 1950 to 2000. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2002. 
From 1950 to 2000, there was a steep drop, dramatic drop in infectious diseases, measles and all the rest, mm -hmm. fantastic. But right next to it was a chart that shows the dramatic, equally dramatic rise of diseases like Crohn's disease, asthma, allergies. Mm -hmm. And they didn't include on the chart mm -hmm. autism and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. that's some neurological diseases and so on. But they, but I okay. made a chart where they, can I add peanut allergy to that, John? Yeah, peanut allergy. Mm. So it, it's it's really stunning that autism was something like one in 5,000 30 years ago, right? And now it's one in 58, at least in North America, mm. for autism diagnoses. It's like, I've never seen anything like it. It's just exploding. So and that also, is absolutely fundamental. And um, so, so you're immune type diseases, autoimmune type diseases, such as Crohn's disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, those immune diseases have just exploded epidemiologically. If you look at Crohn's disease, if you look at a place like China, and that's where Professor Khan has done fantastic work, and he's looked at, at antibiotic use in China, diets in China, and the incidence of Crohn's disease, which was unheard of 30 or 40 years ago in China. It was not something that you ever saw in China. Uh, if you look at, at Crohn's disease and osteoporosis in, in African countries, it was very, very rare. But the, the, so as you've, as we've, let's use the word hygienized ourselves, as we've got rid of our, as we've given our patients antibiotics, as we've We've treated them as we've we've taken away, in particular, worms. You know, we used to we've evolved next to worms. Now, very few of us have worms now in Western societies. In in, in African societies, there's still quite a lot of you know a helminthic burden or a worm burden. But but you know, worms are and parasites in the guts are apex predators. That's that's they they we've evolved over millions of years. The human evolution is about two hundred thousand years old, but certainly prior to that, they were they were hominids, and they all had worms in their bowels. So we've taken an entire class of multicellular organisms inhabiting people's bowels, and we've eradicated them. And and you know we've ended up with this absolute pandemic this 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 crazy you know food allergies have just exploded peanuts and nut allergies were unheard of 30 or 40 years ago the you know autism for instance i don't know if you've read that unbelievable data about autism you see those papers published in cell about autism i mean that's that's like you know it's such it's such hard data where you look at They've they've the, the fecal transplants in 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 smallish groups. The main author there was a an unbelievable scientist called Rosa Kajonic Brown, who's who's did the tightest studies and they took patients with severe autism and gave them fecal transplants and and monitored them and checked that their microbiome became much more variable. The organism they they think is the candidate organism is um, um, Prevotella. Prevotella, yeah. The Prevotella rates, they they saw that, that of, I think there was 18 patients in, in the study with severe autism. I think something like 16 of the 18 patients improved dramatically and none of them had severe autism after this fecal transplant. So there's, and then they, and then that study was followed up by a study in cell also with, with uh, Dr. Brown, Prisani Brown, on the on the author panel, where they they did mouse studies. So what they did is they took the stool of patients with autism and then exposed the mice to this stool, and then they exposed mice to to normal. Well, let's not say normal, we've, we've got to watch our language, but say non-autistic patient stool. 
And so neurotypical is, is, is the, the accepted term. And so the neurotypical stool was given to mice, and these are identical mice, genetically inbred mouse strains. And then the, the autistic patient stool was exposed to the mouse. These mice then had babies, and then they looked at the behavior of, of the baby mice, and they found a way of, of quantifying autistic spectral, spectral behavior in mouse which is obviously, you know, the way mice move and, you know, this, it was obviously a validated study. And they found that, that, that the autistic type could be transferred to the babies of the mice by a stool. So, so yeah. and if you took stool from a severely autistic patient and you took stool from a less severely autistic patient, there was a, an absolute difference. So the severely autistic patients given to the mouse mothers, the mouse mothers had babies that looked severely autistic. And then the less severely autistic mouse, mouse stool recipients had, had babies that were less severely autistic. So you, so there's, there's definitely something in this. And the same studies, similar sort of studies in Parkinson's. You know, and you know every sort of disease you want to imagine, alcoholic hepatitis, the same sort of studies. We get patients, people that we know socially, that drink crazy amounts of alcohol and they're fine. And then you get other people that drink exactly the same amount of alcohol and they get alcoholic hepatitis. If you take the stool of those patients, so patient A who who drinks a lot and has alcoholic hepatitis, patient B who drinks the same amount and is fine, you take patient A stool and give it to mice and you take patient B stool and give it to mice and then feed the mice alcohol, the mice who get the stool from the patient A get alcoholic hepatitis, the mice that get the stool from patient B don't get alcoholic hepatitis and they use exact, they exactly the same mice genetically and they get exactly the same amount of alcohol. Wow. So, and then... Conversely, if you if you feed the stool from a healthy patient or the non non alcoholic hepatitis patient to the mice that now have sadly developed alcoholic hepatitis, you can reverse that process. So, in treating alcoholic hepatitis and cirrhotic patients now, stool transplant is part of of the treatment of these patients in certain circumstances. Wow, so it's, that's amazing. It's cool, isn't it? Yeah, so that brings us to your amazing study in The Lancet. Wow, a lot of work and study design for that. Double blind, placebo controlled. Somebody deserves a bonus for coming up with stool that you couldn't tell wasn't real stool. I guess you added, they added colorant and odorant and... <laughs> yes, and so that's, so that, wasn't, that wasn't a trivial thing. So just to, to sort of, those that are perhaps listening to this that don't, really know how these these complex studies work so the because every one of us is biased and because we we there's a positive publication bias there's a lot of there's a lot of rubbish there's a lot of junk science out there in fact some people would say there's more junk science than good science mm -hmm. and certainly that there's there's a lot of people that believe that might do there, there is a lot of rubbish out there and there's a lot of bias and we all are biased and especially if you do studies, you want your study to work. So to make a study work, firstly, the patient mustn't know that they're getting a placebo and the, the clinician, the doctor who is giving the placebo mustn't know either. So we had to find a placebo that looked, smelled, didn't taste, but, you know, that really fooled the patient and fooled me injecting that, that stool or the placebo. That took months, months and months. It was probably one of the most challenging aspects of the entire study. So, wow. yeah, it was. It so was you tough. had, so you had about 85 people and after omissions and so on, 40 in each group. <clears throat> So 40 people received a placebo 
you did the injection in the beginning and then yeah. they took home home anima kits and five days a week they would do the home anima kits yeah. these are pretty dedicated people because they you know they had to do this for eight weeks and it 50 yeah. 50 chance they were getting a placebo and um so uh i think in the paper you listed you projected that the effectiveness for all sort of colitis of a stool transplant in the way that you do it uh, would be something around 60%. And yeah. it seems like it came out a little bit lower than that, but still encouraging. Uh, yeah. What's your view of how it came out? So about 40%. And as I said, that's the same as you get with anti and, and steroids. Remember, these were selected patients. So these weren't your normal osteoclitis patients. The normal osteoclitis patients are all at home doing well taking tablets. So these were the resistant patients. Mm. And initially when we did the study, I said to my colleagues, who are sort of mega guys and do these studies, and, and I said, we'll never find a patient. I mean, who's going to do this? As you say, you've got a 50-50 chance. You're taking home a bunch of enemas, and then at night you're sticking it into your bottom, and it's, you know, it's not cool. Do you know what? We had, you know, so many patients phoned us. And one guy from Townsville and another chap from Darwin were quite prepared to move states. And, you know, Australia, like America, is a jolly big country. So that's like someone from, let's say, Washington State going to Texas to do the study and uprooting himself and his, his family to go and do the study. It's, so people are so desperate that they, they will do this. And, you know, thank goodness. And, and really all the, all the credit goes to our patients who, who did this, you know, and did this amazing work and, and came in and, and, you know, had scopes and had the stuff infused and took the enemas back home. The one thing that we did do, and that I think ethically you have to do in these studies, is the patients that were on placebo were then offered after the placebo arm of the study was finished, they were given, and all of them did, go, went on to active stool transplants. So, so there was a, a, a you know, we could, we could, everyone could benefit. Mm -hmm. So even if you were one of the unfortunate placebo patients, some of them did quite well actually, but uh, if you were a placebo patient, once you've done your first part of the study, you could go into active stuff. So that was the one part of the study I didn't understand is what the Mayo score is, M-A-Y-O score? Mayo uh, score. Mayo score. So the Mayo score is, is a composite score, which is, which, um, you know, you've got to measure something. So, so all these scores and a lot of the medical scores type scoring systems. And if you go into you know, medicalcalculator.com or whatever, you'll see 4 million schools. So the Mayo School really tries to quantify the severity of osteoclitis. So it looks at clinical things, how the patients feel, certain of their, their tests, and also how, how the colon looks, how much diarrhea they have. So if you've got a colon that looks horrible, that's full of ulceration and bleeding and looks absolutely terrible, then you get a high score. You've got lots of pain, lots of diarrhea, then your score goes up. If you feel well, you've got no diarrhea, no abdominal pain, and your colon looks looks perfect, then you get a, a naught score. So it's just a numerical score that tells you how severe the osteoclitis is. And the importance of that is once you treat the patient, you check the score, you know what it is, and then you can say, look, this guy's score went up from being high, being very sick, to going down and being low. So it, it just gives you a, a quantification of response. How did you choose an eight-week study duration? <clears throat> I noticed somewhere in the paper you commented four weeks may have been enough, that, it, that most of the benefit was seen after four weeks in most patients. Yeah. So, so that was absolutely Professor Barodi, who's been doing this for decades. And the other the sort of pilot-type studies or the other short studies that were done the uh, non-randomized studies prior to this, there were a couple done, not many. Uh, they 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 didn't use enough and didn't do it long enough. So Professor Barodi decided 
you know, we've got to use lots of spoon, lots of bananas, and do it long enough, otherwise you wouldn't see an effect. But, but yes, four weeks probably would have been enough. Yeah. So when you're looking through a colonoscope, you're seeing open wounds of some kind. I saw the pictures, and I have a weak stomach, and mm. <laughs> it looked pretty bad. So, um, and so then, that's, but, it, that, mm -hmm. but eight weeks is enough time for many of them to yes. he yep. heal over. Absolutely. So remember, that is once again uh, an, an example of positive bias. So we showed our best result, or one of our best results. So, so some of the patients were miraculous, and I saw some of them, it was unbelievable. So these were patients who've been on steroids, been on treatment, have got, you know, florid ulcerative colitis. When you go in there with a scope, it looks like a bomb has exploded in their colon. It's all bleeding and ulceration and horrible stuff, just sort of pus-like, awful-looking, you know, it's like having an open festering wound. And that's really what these patients are going through. Their, their colonic mucosa looks like a like an open infected wound. It's really awful. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when we did the follow-up scope and they had been on the, the enemas, which was the only change from previous medication, and the, the transplant, they were completely normal. So, you know, they completely healed. Now, we didn't see that in, in the majority of patients. So we saw a response, as you say, in 40% of patients, and, and a much smaller number of patients had these miraculous responses. But, but if you think about it, it's, it's an incredible response in some patients. But that's, once again, positive bias. So you look at the picture, you see a terrible colon, and then the horrible before picture, and then the after picture, which is pristine and wonderful. That's certainly not what we always see, but it is sometimes what you see. So that's, that's, you know, obviously you, you don't show your worst results, you show your best endoscopic result. So, so why, did, uh, why did you have to wean them off of steroids for the study? Well, you always, you don't, so steroids are, are complicated. You want to try and, you know, get patients into study who aren't on steroids at that stage. Uh, steroids, you know, the steroid is the ultimate immune modulating tool, but it's a shotgun rather than a, a surgical scalpel. So if you can, you try and get patients with steroids. And also- and you had. And you had one patient who, uh, one of the 40 who got a stool transplant and things turned bad for him. And after two weeks, he had to have a colectomy. Yes. So that probably, so that, so that's, that happens. So remember, these are pre-selected patients with severe and intractable ulcerative colitis. And these patients sometimes just go downhill and, and get collected. Um, is that, I don't think you would call it a, a side effect of the stool transplant, it's just the patient was in such a sort of a, a state that they probably would have ended up with a collectomy anyway. So, so certainly the risk of the severe resistant ulcerative colitis subgroup of patients is that they, quite a few of them do end up with a, with a collectomy, yes. So help me, <clears throat> I don't mean to backtrack the C. diff, uh, but for just a minute, help me understand. Uh, I know we focus on the patient who died uh, with a stool transplant for C. diff and, uh, and we talk about risks and so on, but it seems like the risks are so much lower than a heavy dose of antibiotics. Um, I mean, that's how a lot of the, these patients got C. diff in the first place, right? They were in a hospital setting or nursing home. They got a heavy course of antibiotics, and then they got C. diff. Mm. Um, and and it's non-intuitive to think, okay, well, let's go with a, another course of antibiotics. Well, to cure it's, not this. Only, it's not only so. It's it's not really that the antibiotics in themselves represent a risk. the The problem is they don't work. All these C. diff patients have received multiple antibiotic courses. And I must tell you, I seldom see a patient here who hasn't received at least five courses of antibiotics. Wow. And they just don't work. And as you point out, there's, there's many of these patients in the population. And, you know, the 20 or 30,000 a year in the U.S. population that die from this are 
of sick and hospitalized patients. There's, there's many more outside there who, who, who function okay, but they just feel lousy and they've got this horrible diarrhea and they're just toxic. And then, you know, and antibiotics, you know, it's not really about the risk of antibiotics, it's just they don't work. So it's, it's pointless. It's like I giving up the fever. So the 30,000 that die in the United States, <clears throat> these are people who uh, didn't receive a stool transplant for some reason, weren't able to get one or? I suspect so. I mean, I think these, these data, I mean, we know that, that I, I don't think, I don't think that data that I know has been stratified. I don't think it has been stratified. So I'm not sure if that data says these people receive stool transplants and those people didn't. But obviously, most, I mean, that data you quoted was 2015, wasn't it? Yeah, it was uh, from 2015, numbers. from the That's CDC. Yeah. And they, they went on to say that 100,000 of those patients were in rest homes. <clears throat> and 80% of them were over the age of 65. Yeah. So, yeah, certainly, I mean, with, as with all diseases, you know, the older you are, the less reserve you are. But, but in 2015, there certainly wouldn't have been the absolute minority of these patients would have uh, food stool transplant. Absolute I minority. So, I, so I think one can say 99% of those patients just received conventional antibiotic therapy. Yeah. So it seems like, you know, the data's in now for, at least for C. diff, um, stool transplants are just the standard of care. It should be. As Thomas Barodi says, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so what about ulcerative, well, uh, what about Crohn's disease? So I think I've heard you on podcasts before say mm -hmm. you have some doubts about the effectiveness of stool transplants with Crohn's disease. No, well, I don't, I, it's, I wouldn't say doubts. I just don't know. There's just I see. no really good studies. So, so, um, you know, we, we hopefully someone somewhere is going to do the Crohn's study, the same sort of study that, that we did. You guys. Uh, it's not me. <laughs> it, was, it was, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't do the hard work in the study. I must say I was, was really, a, um, I was, you know, Sudosh and the, the, the work. I, I have done hard work in research studies before when, when I was much more, sort of junior than I am now. Now I'm in a position where luckily, you know, <laughs> you get the credit without doing any of the work. But but yes, it's um it's it's it certainly is there to be done. Um but but we don't just don't have the data. Conceptually it would make perfect sense. I think the problem the problem with Crohn's disease is just so much more difficult, isn't it? It's a much more complex disease. It's, 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 you don't, you know, which patients would you, would you select? Would you select patients with Crohn's? So, the, so just for the audience, Crohn's disease, so ulcerative colitis is a colon disease. It affects a segment of the colon and it's, it's always from the rectum upwards. Not always, mostly. So it's, it's an easy disease to sort of, quantify and see what it's affecting. Crohn's disease is a completely different disease. It affects anywhere from the mouth to the anus. So for instance, you can get Crohn's disease, which looks exactly like osteocolitis, or you can get Crohn's disease with a completely normal colon, and then it's in the small bowel. So, and you can get Crohn's disease, in fact, which is in the esophagus, nowhere else. So it's a much more variable disease. It's, it's much trickier, but you know, it's not maybe because you know the microbiome is is a is in the colon. So you know, you conceptually think that that if you looked at Crohn's disease, you probably look at patients with colon Crohn's or Crohn's on the right side of the colon, maybe washing over to the small bowel. I'm not sure, but but I mean, I'm sure the reason it hasn't been done is because it's 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 tougher to study and tougher to monitor and tougher to measure. So I, I, I mean, it will be done. Like it's a, it's a study waiting to be done. And, and it would be an important negative study. So it doesn't, you know, we, we must change our approach to science that, that the negative study is as important as the positive study. It's less glamorous. It's less glamorous to say, I thought this is how things worked. And guess what? I was wrong. 
and it doesn't work like that, and this doesn't help. But that's really important. It's really important to know that 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 the microbiome and stool transplants don't work in plant systems, or do work. We don't know. Conceptually, I'd be surprised if the microbiome isn't important. There is some descriptive data saying that it is important. So Crohn's patients have a less diverse microbiome when you give antibiotics to Chinese patients and they get exposed to Western type diets, which change the microbiome. If you give kids antibiotics, if they have antibiotics before the age of one, the incidence of Crohn's disease goes up something like fivefold. It's extraordinarily strong data. So there's a lot of there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that that almost overwhelming circumstantial evidence, if you if you would, that Crohn's disease and the microbiome are important, you know, cofactors and work together. But to actually do the study is is hasn't been done. I'm maybe they're doing it somewhere. I hope they are. It's not me though. So yeah. so um, sometimes we talk about the gut brain. Uh, barrier, and I, you've corrected some people before, and you have your own name for it. Well, that's that? name. So it's not, it's, it's, so when I speak to my patients, and, and I'm, you know, a believer, so you must always be scared of people who believe in things. Um, but the gut and the brain are intimately connected, and there's a gut brain axis, and there's a gut brain highway. It's not, you know, the, the, and I say to my patients, and I say it, you know, with complete confidence, the gut and the brain are the same organ. You know, <laughs> you know that some people, you know, behave in that way. But, but, you know, for instance, your serotonin, your gut is intimately involved in your serotonin metabolism and traffic and structure. And there was a fantastic nature study, which was published about two years ago, where they looked at, at bacteria in the gut. It was a very tight study, like all the nature studies, and almost unreadable. You know, one page of nature articles is equivalent to, you know, 400 pages of a Raymond Chandler novel. But it's, it's, it's really tough stuff to read through these articles and to sort of see what they mean. But they basically, they took bacteria, they, they, looked at receptors on the bacteria cells and they found an extraordinary, like almost mind-blowing homology between receptors on a bacterial cell and human serotonin receptors. Something like a 37% homology. Now, if you think when bacteria and, and humans, you know, when we last had a common ancestor was was Luca, L-U-C-A, the last universal common ancestor, which is three billion years ago. So we split from bacteria three billion years ago. It's a long time. And somehow there's a, there's a receptor which looks more or less the same and which binds to serotonin that we make. And extraordinarily, if you take serotonin away, these bacterial cells don't grow well. If you add serotonin to these cells, they grow well. And if you take Prozac, then they don't grow so well. So the, the serotonin type receptor that we give people to take away the depression actually binds to bacterial cells and affects their growth. So this is a cell which helps and metabolizes and works with serotonin and serotonin affects it or affects it. It's, 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 you know, if you think about it, how weird is that? I mean, no one could write the script. It's, it's Star Wars and science fiction all in one. It's amazing. That is, that is weird. I know you're on a, a really um, tight schedule, so I'm going to try to um, wind it down, but I wanted, I wanted to ask you, uh, you talked about Prozac. What about the antacids? <clears throat> uh, in the U.S., we get one over-the-counter, Prilosec. I yes. guess you guys call them proton pump inhibitors. Proton pump inhibitors, yeah. 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 And uh, now they're being linked pretty heavily to all kinds of things like SIBO, bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, correct? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, so basically, I'm not that sure about that. I, I prescribe proton pump inhibitors every day. And I take proton pump inhibitors every day. And if I, 
there are times in my life, which I remember vividly, where I wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning after maybe going to a restaurant and having a good meal and a couple of glasses of wine. And I wake up at 3 a.m. and I can feel this horrible reflux and I reach for my proton pump inhibitor and I forgot it's not there. And then I, I curse myself and I make sure that I always have a stock of proton pump inhibitors. So, so the, the reason we need proton pump inhibitors is because as humans, we have a design fault. Uh, the sphincter between our stomach and our esophagus in 30% of patients doesn't function properly. And our stomach is an amazing organ. It's a big, fat, thick, strong organ. And ancient people or people used to take stomachs and bind them off and make soccer balls out of stomachs so they could kick it around and have fun. Stomach's a tough organ. Esophagus is a, is a real softy organ. It's, it's not made for acid. Our stomachs make acid with a pH of one. So a pH, we eat food, which has a pH of seven. And our acid has a pH of one. What does that mean? So it's a logarithmic scale. So it's like the Richter scale in reverse. So an earthquake of Richter scale of five is a slight tremor that you feel in California often. A Richter scale nine earthquake would knock you flat and kill most of the people, you know, in the vicinity. So it's, 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 you know, 10 to the power of, of whatever. So a pH of seven, which is the pH that we live in, our blood has a pH of seven, our food has a pH of seven, is a million times less acid than a pH of one in the stomach. Why did our stomach go through an extraordinary evolutionary design to produce deadly acid, you know, a million fold more acid than we can cope with. And, and how's this acid in this tough organ, which can resist acid? Why did we do it as an evolutionary ploy? Cause we don't need acid nowadays. I, I have got no stomach acid in my stomach at the moment because I've made sure I've took my proton pump and everything this morning. How can I be, and I'm well and healthy and I can do cool things. Um, I survived without any acid. Why would the, the body have designed acid? Because it's a big deal. It's a massive design thing. And the reason for that is because 50 years ago, 100 years ago, certainly 200,000 years ago, when we were designed as, as animals, we, we ate rotten food. So our stomach acid is, is designed to sterilize our food. So if you think of a, of a, a nasty organism like a salmonella or shigella or some horrible thing get, going into your stomach, it slips down the esophagus. It's really comfortable in the esophagus or in the mouth and it hits the stomach and suddenly there's a million times more acid in the stomach. It burns the daylights out of the bacteria and then it shoots through the pylorus where it suddenly hits a bile and a, a pH of eight, which is, which is, you know, 10 million times different pH. And that knocks most bacteria. So, our stomach acid is made to sterilize things. Um, unfortunately, the stomach acid goes into our esophagus and gives us reflux, and 30% of us have reflux. We, we need to control that acid in any way of treating reflux. So if you've got genuine reflux, you need a proton pump inhibitor. Mm. Um, I'm not that convinced about that it causes small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I think it's, you know, certain diseases go in and out of fashion. And I sometimes feel that, that SIBO is overdiagnosed. Just like Candida a little while ago, Candida was very fashionable and it's sort of gone a little bit out of fashion as well. So although I do think there are patients who have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, I think a lot of patients who, who have that diagnosis probably don't have it. So I don't think it's a real problem in patients on proton pump inhibitor therapy. There are some data that say that it increases your incidence of, of clostridium. I think that is genuine. So I do think you do have a slight increase in clostridium in patients on, on long-term proton pump inhibitor therapy. I think the risks are small. There's a lot of data on the internet saying it causes dementia, osteoporosis, and things like that. Uh, Paul Moyedi, the chap who did the, that, that first osteopolitis study. He's a great scientist. He did a fantastic study at McGill University disproving that a proper 
well-designed prospective study looking at do proton pump inhibitors actually cause osteoporosis, dementia, etc. And they th that study was very reassuring. So I can reassure my patients when I put them on proton pump inhibitor therapy, and I am very happy to use it myself. So I, really think, great. I think that, that data is probably not mm -hmm. a little bit overblown. I think it was Tim Spector who said, <clears throat> you really ought to think about freezing your own poop. That way, if you get you know, into trouble, do a new sample every six months in the freezer or something like that, and <laughs> double back it, I don't know. Yeah. And uh, Just to interrupt you on that level, yes, but only if you have a minus 80 freezer at your house. Minus so, 80, yeah. So, you know, when we do our stool preparation, we, we sort of mash it up and we, it's very basic stuff. We mash it up, we sieve it, we filter it. We don't, we put on, put in glycerol uh, uh, and sort of like an antifreeze type thingy and we put it straight into a minus 80 freezer. So we get it super fresh. Our donors come to my lab and they, they're fabulous people. They pass the stool and then bring, it has to be absolutely fresh. And that's the limitation of the seed, the family school, because the families, you know, it's quite hard for them to, to pass the school when they should. Our donors are well trained. So they come in, they're not allowed to open their bowels in the morning. They've got to come in and when we're ready and waiting, then they pass the school. And we honestly, it's still, you know, super fresh. Because as you said, these anaerobic organisms die quickly. And it's a, it's logarithmic as well. That you expose stool to air and particularly if you, if you filter it or you sort of mash it up, then there's a big surface area exposure. That time has to be absolutely limited because they die quickly and the good stuff dies. So the good die young. The stuff that you're not interested in, that can survive. But the good stuff that you want to really cool the ferrochutes and the prepatellas and stuff like that, they really delicate. And then you've got to put it as quickly as you can. We filter it, we put it in the glycerol, and we pop it in the minus 80 freezer quickly. And that makes it survive. Minus 80 freezers are not cheap. So yes, if you if you come to my lab and give me your stool, I'll put it in my minus 80 freezer. But if you put it in a normal freezer, it's not going to work. I see. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> that, that reminds me of one more question I forgot. You said the microbiome shifted in your study. Um, and it shifted towards Prevotella and away from... No, that wasn't my study. That was in the autism study. Oh, it so, was? No, that was in that, that great, that um, Rosa Krajelny Brown study, which was, I think it's one of the best studies I, I've ever come across. It's so fabulous. I see. I see. Well, thank you so much. It, um, you know, I've heard you on various different podcasts and I thought, wow, this guy is just so coherent and so knowledgeable and he sees patients and he does research. And, uh, you know, if you, if you try to search for Thomas Barodi, you just don't find much about interviews with him or even Professor Cam. They're just, but I've seen you on the SIBO uh, podcast. I've seen you in various different places, heard you and, and uh, thought, wow, this guy really knows what he's, what he's talking about. So thank you so mm -hmm. much, especially for an American audience where they're saying, uh, doctors don't really like to do these and they're highly regulated. Um, maybe we should do it as DYI, do, do it yourself. Um, mm -hmm. What does that involve? <laughs> it's like, oh boy. Uh, my son-in-law is a family physician and he hates the idea of, you know, people using unscreened stool and doing their own yeah. kit. But so, but, you know, if you can't get it any other way, then you understand it. I had one patient who came to see me with Crohn's disease, and he was an incredible guy, an engineer, and he bought an industrial centrifuge, was using that and using the stool supernatant, which you know supernatant doesn't really work, but but he he invested twenty thousand dollars in his own laboratory to to use stool supernatant for his own purposes. It didn't work, but didn't but work. It, it didn't use it right. Mm, too yeah. bad. I have heard stories of some Crohn's patients, their anecdotes, but they appear on podcasts as guests and say, yeah, it worked for me, but it was hard. It took months and I have to keep redoing it every mm. six months or something. Yeah. Yeah. So Crohn's, uh, we just don't know. It's not, we just don't know. Simple as that. Yeah, tough disease. Really tough. And it's a young person's disease, right? It starts, start, do you get patients that are like 15 years old with Crohn's disease? Yeah, so it's a, so mainly 15 to 25. It's a real, it's a real challenge. 
you do get patients presenting at an, at an older age. So, for instance, celiac disease, 20% of celiacs present beyond the age of 60. Um, Crohn's disease traditionally took 18 months to diagnose. Uh, the lag time is much less now because we, we, we better at diagnosing and people are more aware of it and it's become more common. So any disease that becomes more common is, is easy to diagnose. If you go to any African clinic, they'll diagnose, diagnose your malaria in one and a half seconds. If you go to a North American clinic with a funny fever disease, they'll take a long time to diagnose malaria just because they don't see it. So you see lots of Crohn's, you'll diagnose. So I have a friend who, <clears throat> I would guess he was 18 or something, and uh, I was attending a church service, and I walked out uh, to the parking lot, and between cars, he was vomiting on the asphalt, and his vomit had blood in it. And it's like, Brad, what's going on? And he says, yeah, this happens a lot. <clears throat> you know, when I, I got into Halloween candy, and, you know, I get these flares, and it happens. Well, what is it, Brett? No, oh, I don't know. Well, you better go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. So he gets diagnosed with Crohn's disease and he has to go to Stanford and get operated on. And I guess these lesions are scattered throughout the body. So yeah. Yeah. they did an operation. He would stand up and get dizzy and break out in a sweat. So they went in again. He stood up and broke out in a sweat. His parents, who are good friends of mine, said we were prepared to lose Brad at that point. And they went in a third time and got it. And but he's still on heavy medication and mm. it's yeah. it's a really tough disease. He's a young guy, he's a young, fit surfer, looks yeah. like a million dollars. So yeah. but he's really the tough. Of the pool well probably looks like one dollar. So he's so yeah. yeah. So Crohn's disease is a weird disease. So often these young patients get a, a tight narrowing in the bowel and they can get multiple tight narrowings. So he obviously presented with with um, obstructive a small bowel obstruction which is a really horrible disease. It's very painful. Um, it's awful. You vomit, you, your bowel blows up. It can perforate. It's a horrible disease. And Crohn's also classically creates fistulas. So it creates a, what is a fistula? It's a connection between loops of bowel. So a fistula can also be between the bowel and the skin. And Crohn's patients classically get fistulas in their anus. So, so the rectum and the anus yeah, form tunnels that, that that leak can become infected and do horrible things. Um, the, the most famous fistula patient was someone in St. Mark's Hospital who had a Crohn's fistula coming from his colon or his small bowel and penetrated through his skin and ended up on the bottom of his foot. So these fistulas are inflammatory sort of tunnels that tunnel all the way through your, your mucosa and sort of tunnel through skin and tunnel into your vagina or tunnel into your bladder and tunnel into, you know, different parts of your body and tunnel into your rectum, your anus and your anal muscle. So horrible disease. Wow. Well, and we didn't even talk about a lot of the other diseases. There's so many and so complex. I don't know how you do it. But anyway, thank you so much. I'll be in contact in, um, in a few days and you can take a look at it before I publish it. No, I just publish it. I don't mind. It's all good. Okay. I haven't, said anything, I haven't said anything that I don't believe in. Uh, maybe I said something. Okay. That, it doesn't matter. You've got to put Good. yourself. I don't care. I'm fine. Well, I, hope it, I hope it gets tons of views because um, it's just so important. So Fantastic. Thanks for the chat. It was fun. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nice to meet right. you. Bye-bye.